Oh, you're, but, the, what, what, you're the one that's still playing guitar, though. That's that's the thing. Still playing it badly. Uh, <laughs> not at all. But, uh, here's a question that I ask every person that comes on. Yeah. How did we meet? Do you remember how we met? Through... Well, it would have been through Chris. Yeah. Uh, God, I can't even remember his second name now. Campbell. Campbell, aye. So I threw Chris Campbell, and then... Can't mind if we met at one of one of the Sooth gigs years ago, or if it was right, we actually, or if it was just we, at the we, studio at well, what was I think at the time RSAMD. Well, we I remember we we played Chris's band, um, Loose Lips Sink Ships. Aye, aye. So they had um, they had got. There was the four of them, and they were had just got together, and they were looking to get just some kind of demo recorded, relatively cheap, and uh, just so they could keep shop it around to try and start getting gigs. Ah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this was back when it was MySpace, and you would put oh, up like your demo. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, can we have a gig, please? Here's my MySpace link. <laughs> pretty much, I. And um, what happened was, I had like a. It's, it's old now, but it was like a 16, 16 track Korg, uh, Korg um, digital um, recorder. Aye, aye. So Chris had said, us, any chance we'll just pay you and drink and uh, can you come along <laughs> to our rehearsal space and uh, and just, we have got like five songs written or six songs, whatever it was. Yep. And uh, so I went along to the rehearsal space and it was like, a, it was just a Saturday and a Sunday and all I did was um, mic'd up all the drums and then got the guitarist set up so that the drummer was playing along to the guitarist with the headphones. Aye. So basically I recorded all the drums and then just layered everything bit by bit yep. on top of it. it. Sounded absolutely crap like, but it was just uh, <laughs> it was a fun weekend eh? but what happened was uh, Saturday, Sunday right, that's it done. Sent them across his, the mixes uh, on like Wednesday or the Thursday or whatever it was yeah. and then contacted me on the Tuesday of the following week and he said we've, wait, we've got our first gig uh, however we've just chopped the guitarist is there any chance because he knew I could play is there any chance you could quickly learn all the songs and uh, be ready for Friday and I <laughs> so I was like uh, I, I, th I think so Aye. And, uh, I was completely winging it, right? But we played a gig, and it was your neck of the woods because I don't, I don't remember where it was, but it was a way out. Sort of, I don't know if it was Paisley or something. It was a way was out. It, was, it, was, it, was it the Crow or something in Paisley Crow Bar? Maybe. I can't even remember the name. I know that you went through Glasgow as if you were heading towards the airport, like it was Aye, a way yeah. in that. And uh, there was obviously your band was playing, and I don't. Maybe there was another band. I can't. I can't remember. Uh, but I, um, I think Chris already knew you guys, or, he, or he, at least I think he knew DJ I, through snowboarding or Biffy uh, Clyro. Uh, Biffy something. Clyro message board, I think, <clears throat> and that, uh, that in uni, I think, or maybe I, maybe the snowboarding. And um, so I don't, I don't know if it was just by chance that we ended up playing at the same time or if he'd maybe said to DJ... Oh, I can't mind. And any chance you could squeeze us on the the bill, but um, we turned up and I was like, I'm not quite sure. I was like, once we start playing the songs, I'll remember, but I had to keep saying to Fraser, the drummer, after every song, mm -hmm. like, come to me, how does, how does the next song go? So I remember, because I, <laughs> I couldn't remember like the names and... What how they what song was what name, and it was a. Uh, but I remember you, you let me use your amp, so at least that was something. Uh, I think that must have been. I think it was called Crowbar or something. Uh, and I, remember, I think we remember the guy the the tech on that gig. I always remember this because we always like were like oh we're quite loud. Like any time you'd go do a gig and you'd get asked the usual questions like how a style of music are you off the engineers and then I remember them going. I think as we sound checked, it was like, do you want to turn up on stage or turn down on stage? I remember like that. <laughs> okay, 
kind of questions that we wanted to turn up on stage and he was like cool well what I'll do is and it was the first engineer that ever said it I'll just not put you in the PA and you can be as loud as you want on stage and we were like were you just, were you just like that there's a number 10 just bump it up to 11 <laughs> just, just keep going <laughs> Because he was like, I'll give you nothing, no guitars in the monitors if these are just going to turn up. And we were like, great. And it was brilliant. It was one of the, I remember it being one of the loudest gigs I think we'd ever played, if it's the same mm-hmm. gig. And just being like, aye, that's, that's maybe how we should do it more often. But then I, as we get older yeah. and more experienced, you're like, nah, it's a stupid idea. But I think I think we ended up doing a few gigs together. Uh, I think uh, no, I. I mean, I remember seeing, uh, playing it nice and sleazy downstairs. Aye, yep. And, um, and then I came along to a couple of your gigs as well, just to kind of cheer you on. Right, so how is it? How did you know Chris? So me and Chris were in a band when I would have been 15, 16. Right. Because Chris wasn't even, he was taking driving lessons at the time. He's a year older than me, so he would have been 17, I would have been 16. And uh, we were in a band for like maybe three or four years as teenagers. Ah, right, okay. And then... I hadn't actually seen Chris for a, for maybe five or six years, albeit we'd kept in touch, but I just yeah. hadn't really, you know, your life kind of goes like that. Aye, aye. And, then, and then it was, he knew I was doing a bit of rec- like home recording and stuff, and that was when he contacted me. And uh, and I ended up just, it wasn't in my type of music or that, but it was fun just playing I'm in a band again. Absolutely, aye. And, uh, and at, at that time, I was kind of like, right, I need to kind of get out. And I just I wanted to do gigs and all that sort of thing, so it was almost irrelevant. But then, obviously, as it went on, you get to write, be part of the writing process and stuff like that. But, um, so see, Gro- where are you originally from? Are you just Glasgow? No, uh, Aloha, originally. Aloha? I, I didn't know. So we were born Aloha until I think it was in, like, primary one. And then we moved to Perth for four years, and then primary or five years, and then primary six moved to Kirkluck. But right. I don't know if you do you know Kirkluck at all. Yeah, a wee bit. I know. Uh, it's fucking shit hole. <laughs> <laughs> and then was there. I in, was there until I was an adult, and then I moved out, studied in Edinburgh for a year, for two years, uh, and then moved back through. And then by the time I was working, I had a shared a flat with a pal that was carnage for a year. Or might only yeah. been six months. It was that much carnage. Uh, and Wisha, and then I ended up staying in Glasgow with my older brother for a number right. of years. See, when you were younger, were you into music when you were really wee? Uh, I, you know, like my parents were into music and all that, and that uh, is. <laughs> embarrassing to say but like my, my first I uh, like my first sort of records I remember listening to, they had the Abba Gold album which I was never a fan of and then then they had a Cliff Richard record that had Devil Woman on it <laughs> and me, me, and my, me and my wee brother who was a drummer in Sooth uh, two years absolutely loved it because it was like kind of rockier guitars and all that and you're like oh this is kind of more what we're into or more what we, we liked as a kid uh, and then it wasn't, it wasn't until really we moved to Kirkluck and I would have been what primary six I would have been what nine yeah I think when we moved and my pal like one of my first pals at that school a guy called Ross Gilmer he his brother his older brother uh one day was when he was like, oh, what kind of music you into? And I was like, don't really know. And he was like, Here, here's here's a couple of cassette tapes for you. And I was like, all right, took them home, had a listen. So one of them was Master of Puppets. The, yeah. other, the other two were Kiss Alive 1 and Kiss Alive 2. Mm-hmm. And it was like, then it was just like, I've never heard just, this music like this yeah, ever. You're, was just opened up to something completely new. I, I, I mean, it had gone from like, like my, I think it was my grand maybe listened to, I'm going to say Chuck Berry, but it wasn't Chuck Berry. So there was a wee bit of kind of, there was like a wee bit of rock and roll, but oh, yeah. my dad was a minister, there wasn't a, there wasn't a decent rock and roll in the house. Uh, so I, so it was, it wasn't until I moved to Kaluk and 
met pals, big brothers who were into different bands and different styles of music. Uh, That's similar to my. That was similar to myself because I was listening. Like my dad had a pretty good musical taste. He was, yep. listening, but it was bands like that he grew up with. So it was bands like the Stones, the uh, Beatles, yeah, the Doors. Yeah. He loved Led Zeppelin, like U2. I still like all that sort of stuff, but it wasn't until I was probably similar, maybe about, I, I was still at primary school, so I was probably about 10, and my friend came down with a copy of a cassette tape, uh, and he was just like, he was a year older than me, and he was just like, listen to this, and of course, no idea what it was, it was the Master of the Puppets, it was like, uh, yeah, well, that was it, like, so I had a couple of, other pals in Kurluk that had older brothers. One of my mates, his stepbrother was, I don't know, maybe he'll be about maybe eight years older than us. So he was in it. Oh, and he was like one hair metal. Aye, proper metal and just all different styles of music. And I always remember like all his music that you got handed down for his older brother. You would have hmm. like that different again and this is different and that's different. And it's funny that I wasn't exposed just, to, to music when I was you, younger than that, really. You would just copy constantly, like, new stuff on to, to, to tapes and hope that you had a tape that was long enough. Because see, the albums, I never, it would get to, like, the last song of Side One, and I never knew how the song ended because it would stop halfway Aye. through it. Oh, I, I remember uh, going, going on a few, few years when Limp Biscuit released Significant Other. And mm -hmm. I bought it on CD, but at the time, I think I was maybe 19 or 20. And my yeah. the car that I had access to, my dad's car, didn't have a CD player, only had a tape player. And I remember I dragged, <laughs> me and my mate went in to, would have been HMV on our Gile Street in Glasgow to buy it. Got home, and I think my girlfriend at the time was with me. And we, the first thing we did when we got home was like straight to my room, got a cassette, and recorded the CD, and she was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm recording this on the tape. She's like, why? I'm like, because I need to listen to it in the car. <laughs> She's like, you joking? You just bought it? I'm like, aye, but if we're going to go back out, I want to listen to it, and I can't listen to it, because it's on CD. And was there ever a worse feeling in the world when your tape, cassette tape was playing, when you heard it starting to... <laughs> Stick to the tape. To get... <laughs> aye, and what you would... Press eject, and when you pull the tape out, or the wire was, or the tape Aye. was coming out, to try and wheel it in without breaking it, or it, you'd end up with that one wee bit of the song, like for 15 seconds, it would um, be all like. Aye, it was all mince. Have you ever. <laughs> no, this, this is a daft, daft story that it's never left my head, but between where my best pal at the time stayed in Kurluk, there was. He stayed in a village called Law, and there was maybe. I don't know a two mile stretch of road with nothing on yep. it that went for the old mm -hmm. law hospital up to Kerluk. And clearly folk, their tapes would get chewed in the car and we'd just fling them out the window. So when you were on a, right. when you were on a walk down at my pal's house, sometimes you would like find old cassette tapes and you'd be like, oh, wind it back in, take it home and see yep. what it is. <laughs> and I don't, I, don't know, I don't know who came up with the story, but <laughs> somebody told me, oh no, no, you don't want to listen to them because what happens is witches record spells onto the tapes <laughs> and then when you listen to them back you'll be cursed with a spell I remember and being like 18, 19 probably thick as mince and believing it somewhat and be like oh no, no, I need to listen to it now no spells, well, were, can... no spells were ever cast unfortunately but always, that's always stuck in my head like, what a great story well, I can remember growing up and the, my parents had the hi-fi at the back of the living room that had the, the record player on top yeah, and don't know where I'd heard it, but I'd read something about oh, if you play it, if you play it backwards, there's like messages and stuff. Ends up my dad, you know, three weeks later, who's been messing with the records? Everything's <laughs> destroyed. In here. Uh, <laughs> I, I will. Well, back. Me, me and my wee brother wrecked. You know how that Abba Gold I was telling you about. Me and my right. wee brother wrecked. We totally scratched that record because we thought it'd be a good idea to use like the hi-fi record deck is a DJ deck of course <laughs> try, try and scratch it with it didn't, didn't work wreck uh, wreck here's, here's a question for you right so obviously you're, you're young Christmas birthdays you you know you'll what do you want and you'll say I want this or that and you get a present but 
Do you remember the first album you ever bought with your own money? Uh, I it was on a holiday island, so this would have been after we'd moved to Kaluk, so it would have been like, I don't know, primary seven or first year. No, it would have been primary seven. Okay. We'd gone somewhere on holiday and we must have either been given money to be like, ah, here's some money for your holiday. And we went to a town, can't even remember which town it was, uh, found a record shop, went in and bought Ride the Lightning on cassette. And I think I bought something else, but I can't remember what it was. Bye. Yeah. And then I remember we went back to the house and there was a, must have been a cassette deck in that house. First thing, straight in. Played it to death. Aye, uh, yep. Brilliant. I was I loved it. I was the same, except it was Injustice for All. Aye. My first CD. My first CD. Aye, my first CDs, that was. was Vulgar Display of Power and Injustice for All. Because I think yeah. I'd got. I'd asked for a hi fi or a CD player for my room for my Christmas or my birthday, Aye. which are dead close together. So I used, used to be quite good. You'd ask for like one thing for your birthday. And then like, yep. like, and then a butt stack of CDs for your Christmas. So you had a week to wait. Aye, aye. Well, I'm I'm December as well, so I know what you're talking about. But my first CD was um, Iron Maiden, Made in England, which was the the Seventh Son live tour, like the recording. And the reason I got it was because it came with a in a big box thing that had a VHS of the same concert. Oh, nice. So you could. Have, watch it as well as actually listen to it in C D. Ah uh, yeah. But pretty cool. But um I'm assuming discovering all that music was what you got you like a, a what a guitar. Was that uh, what got you what guitar? I I mean I, I know that like when we were younger like my mum didn't play like a, nah she, she always she had, there was a piano in the house but I don't think she ever really played the piano. I don't she, she didn't study music at all. So when we were kids growing up, she was like, I want all you to learn an instrument. And at least to like, say like grade one, like my wee brother was a drummer, but he was told he had to learn a bit of music. So he was like, all right, I'll do piano till to grade one. That, 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 that was the deal. You can get a drum kit once you learn grade one and piano. Like my older brother, uh, maybe because my dad played a wee bit of guitar, my older brother picked guitar. And then because we were so close in age, but are so close in age. I was like, I'll follow my big brother and I pick guitar as well. But then, I, because of the music influence, then it was like, I will. Uh, is it pretty much, or was there other, do you play anything else or is it pretty much just a guitar? Just guitar. Like, I had to pick a, a second instrument for higher and standard grade music, but, and because there was drum kits in the house, just went with the drums, but. Do you do singing as well or is it, is it just playing? Uh, I mean, we did in South, there was like a wee bit of like, backing vocals, but no, nah, I'm no, I'm no singer. Are you like a, are you a lead guitarist, rhythm guitarist, a wee bit of both? Uh, I mean, down to, I think, my own self-confidence or lack of, like, was never a lead guitarist, like, I never... Because we were, we were both... Wasn't he, wasn't he good at scales enough? Didn't he know the theory enough, really? And was, I, mean, I don't I, think there'd be no talented enough to actually write a decent solo. The one that I'd be happy to like, put in a song and go, aye, that's good. Let's well, do this. I think we're the same age. What age are you? F just uh, just on 40, 42. Uh, so I'm 42 as well. Because so, we're at that that funny thing. If you, were, if you liked your rock music in the 90s, there was kind of like two camps because there was aye. the... The first half of the nineties where you were still getting like your Metallica, Iron Maiden, Pantera that had proper lead stuff. Yeah. And then you had the second which was like your down tuned death tones corn where souls were pretty much non existent. Right. And the, they both had I, I like I probably was more the first half rather than the second half to be honest. But I, I did like some Like I think like definitely like my guitar teacher at the time when I first started playing guitar, like he would encourage you like to learn it, and I suppose he kind of followed. I can't mind what the school is that did like the the grading, whatever the London school is that does the grading. Okay. I think I got to. Well, higher was equivalent to like grade five. Right. So you had to play. I seem to remember doing. 
a bad attempt at the solo and enter Sandman for my hire. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of about as far as it went. Writing, though, in later years, I, there was a few bits here and there, but like nothing that you would class like a typical guitar solo. It was always like a wee melody line to fill in a part of a song more than anything else. Here's a question. Do you remember your, what was the first concert you went to? Uh, oh, well, now, what? Profe- Yourself. Professional band or? Aye, professional. Uh, Smashing Pumpkins in 92 at the SEC. Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> so that would have been Melon. Melancholy and Infinite Sadness tour, or maybe it was later that. Maybe maybe it was ninety four. I didn't think, think back then. I thought it was a few years before they got bigger. Ah, uh, maybe nah. It's maybe later than that. To be fair, it's maybe like maybe ninety six or ninety seven. Aye, uh, maybe mm. ni- ninety two is probably way off actually. Uh, but aye, that that would have been the first. I think I would have been aye uh, third or fourth year in high school, maybe. Yeah, and then after that. Uh, I can't mind what came after that, but I just. What was the last one you went to? Uh, God, what was the last one I went to? I can't mind. Are you, are you but I'm going. So I'm going to. Know, like. I'm going to go and see an Irish band called The Scratch the morning night at King Tut. So that should be good. Right. Okay. So see, um, pick it up the guitar. Aye. Did, did you? Have it? go to, to guitar lessons or did you just self were you self taught? Nah nah guitar lessons there was a a guy when we were in Kerluk there was a guy uh, called Brian Riley who like taught all local guitarists at seemed to be in right. like all the local bands. Uh, so he was based in Lanark. And I still think he's teaching the now. Uh, and did you know all the all the basics basically I uh, pretty much I don't remember doing much theory really but like mm. it was uh, I was all Playing, we used to go on a a Wednesday. Was it a Wednesday night or a Friday afternoon or something up to his house in Lanark? Uh, I remember it all, all nearly stopped because he had a heart attack. I think <laughs> maybe about, is that from teaching? <laughs> maybe teaching all the daft lanes, <laughs> aye. Uh, yeah. But then we couldn't find another local guitar teacher, or nobody could re- really recommend one other than Brian. So it's yeah. cool. I was like, well. Oh, I think it, it must have been when I was in start or third year and I'd picked music and I was like, well, mm-hmm. if I'm not going to learn, because there was no guitar teacher at the school, yeah. so I ne- nearly started learning the saxophone, which probably would have been a bad thing, but at the time I could think, the only thing saxophone was in was like really shit 80s music. Yeah. Well, right, when right. I say at the time I thought it was shit 80s music, but now you're like, I actually... The saxophone would have been kind of cool to learn, but I then it wasn't yeah. up until I think it was like my first lesson I went for, and then I think my dad had phoned and said, "Oh, by the way, Brian's back teaching again." So it was like, "Oh, great!" <laughs> it was like I could sack the saxophone malarkey and go back to the guitar. Small time there, you could have been that guy on the beach from the Lost Boys. Could have been <laughs> <laughs> oiled up and like playing uh, your heart out. Yep. Yeah. Um, so were you always see starting a band when you were I'm assuming you were a teenager and you're like, I want to start a band? Uh, and was no. it with your brother? I, I I can't even mind I don't really remember being Well no, actually no, I did. We tried me and one of my pals tried to start a band kinda tail end of high school with his cousin. Uh didn't get anywhere. We wrote a couple of wee riffs, a couple of wee tunes, we did Never gigged or anything, we did a couple of covers and that, but... Just a bit of fun. Aye, my wee brother, so it was my wee brother DJ and one of their pals, Ian, had a band, or had just started, like, jamming in our garage. Yeah. Uh, and I think at some point they must have thought, oh, we need a second guitarist. So mm-hmm. David's like, ah, well, okay, get him involved. So, aye, that started off... So we had a cover band first... Uh, called Dominate, which we did. It was all like the easier Metallica stuff that didn't have solos in it, so the stuff off a of load and all that. Yeah. Uh, some Lunt Biscuit stuff, Green Day, all that kind of stuff. Just that all, all you, the standard 90s type uh, stuff. Uh, that you played down the local youth centre, so. Yeah. But, uh, it was good, that was I, good fun, and then uh, after a year or so, how it did, did that. How did it come about? Or Sorry? did you have anything? 
How did Sooth come about, the band? Uh, so the singer that was in that previous band, we had a gig at the Cat House one night, <laughs> and his, his girlfriend came with him, and she was blazing after... By the, even even I think maybe even before sound checks or whatever or she was drinking <laughs> when we were doing sound checks and she was I think she was only like sixteen at the time and we were I think I we must have been eighteen she was underage but they were like she can come in if she stays about with you and you are in before the doors open so I like, I, I never bother so we did sound checks went and get dinner uh, and then by the time they came back the doors were open. And she was drunk as fuck, and they were just like, "No, she's not coming in." Mm-hmm. But he was like, "But I'm, I'm what a singer in one of the bands that's playing the night." So we had to get the promoter came down. He's like, "Look, I'll keep a hot air in the office, get a coffee, sober her up." Yeah. Uh, but the singer was adamant. He was like, "I'm, I'm not coming in if she's not allowed in," and because the bouncers yes. were like, "No, no, she's not coming in. Even if you're going to look after her, she's not coming in." So we did that gig with a singer. <laughs> See the same. Thing happened to, to ourselves. We, when I was, I would have been 18. Chris would have been 19. The, the youngest one in the band was the drummer. He was 17. Oh, and uh, we got a gig in Pleasies downstairs. So you go in the afternoon, set up everything, do your sound check. And then, you know, you've got four or five hours to kill. So let's go to McDonald's or wherever, you know, wherever it was. So we wander off and then... By the time you come back at night, there's, a, there's bouncers now standing on the door. <laughs> and they'll not, they'll, not let the drum, they'll not let the drummer in because he's only 17. Uh-huh. So we have to pull him in the window at the back. Uh-huh. Where the toilets are. Uh-huh. Pulled out. <laughs> on the stage, he'd done his, uh, he obviously played his drums and then he had to climb back out the window. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. We used to do, there was a, a bar in Motherwell called Starker. Uh, and we used to do gigs in there when we were, I think, oh, ears were on, I was, I was the oldest in the band, I was maybe 18, but they used right. to pay you in beer, and like, my wee brother was like 15 at the time and all that, <laughs> you're like, yep. brilliant, aye, so I so that singer, after that gig at the cat house, I think we were like, well, no, you're not doing the gig, and it was one of those where, like, DJ, my wee brother, was still in high school, so it was like a full coach of folk, like, I don't know, we maybe had about 100 folk turned up to see us, which in those days was unreal, that's a lot, and it was yeah. so I so it was all these folk turned up and then nobody nobody saw the full gig because you had no singer. And we'd written all like we'd started writing all our own stuff, so a lot of it was like our own tunes. But did you did someone step up and, and try to uh, sing or was I, it? DJ <clears throat> he'd been doing I think he'd been maybe been doing backing vocals at the time, uh and some of the songs. So then he was might, like, might... Well, I'll i I'll just try and do as much as I can. And then I... I took it for there, and then after that gig, we were like, "Well, why don't we keep it this?" Or we, no, well, we tried a couple of singers. Nothing really gelled. Well, quite uh, happy. I quite happy with the four years. So then we stuck with that and decided, saw that we'll scrap it, we'll scrap the name. I can't mind if we scrapped any of the original stuff, but decided not to do. Maybe keep a cover or two. And how did you, how did you come up with the band name? Because that is always a <coughs> sore point. Forty bands uh, like the, the, up before the band start because nobody can agree on a name. Aye, uh, do you remember the comic books Asterix and Obelix? Mm-hmm. Aye, uh, so they've got there's a book called Asterix, Asterix and Obelix and the Sooth Sooth Sayer. So that's oh. where it came from. Like I had those books lying about the house and don't know, just looked up the topic of a Sooth Sayer and I was like, ah, oh, it's quite fitting for a band. So just cut it short a wee bit and. Uh, so- yep. The rest is history. It is indeed. Uh, and then I, I Brian wasn't the bassist at that point, though. Uh, it was a couple of years, maybe a year or so after that, that the bassist he went. And then we stole Brian for a band called Chianti uh, that were for sort of Wisher kind of way. Uh, so DJ had broken up. I think it was he broke his pinky in his hand, in his left hand. So couldn't they play yeah. guitar? So we're like, we got Brian, who was a guitar player uh, in this band, Chianti. So we'd asked him to play. And then we were out of bassist players shortly after those gigs. And then we were like, right, saw that Brian was a great player. Let's get Brian. So we stole him. 
Yeah. So we we use on the go for about ten years, or something like that. About that, aye. Because I usually I do it this I do these in my, my man cave, and I've got a big notice board uh, behind us. It's got like old uh, ticket stubs and blah blah. Aye, aye, and, yeah. I, and there's one. It must have been your last gig. There's there's a sooth one. And because uh, me, and my friend came along to see his play. I, I don't even know where it was now, but Darker, we came on. That was that was the Starker bar I was telling you about when we used to get paid in beer. All right, you're wrong. We came along to your last gig because the place was absolutely packed. Aye, aye. I remember I got my guitar stuck in the cargo net that was above the stage. <laughs> aye, that was 2009. I'm sure it said. Aye, probably. I probably would have been aye. Back when we were just young things. Aye, aye. <laughs> <laughs> aye, it's, so, quite, it's quite funny, like. My my seven year old loves getting in my car. Like I've got an old Peugeot that I drive about, and it's still got a CD player in it. So I've got a wee mm-hmm. wallet of CDs that I keep in the car, and he's always like, "Oh, can we listen to this? Can we listen to that?" And normally, like, there's two CDs. There's a Municipal Way CD and a Devil Driver CD that he normally likes to listen to. But then yeah. going through, he's like, "What's this white one?" And I was like, "Oh, that's mine." It's like it's the old band. So he's recently started getting into that, and and he's a bit like, "Oh, is that?" Who's that playing guitar? And I say, that's me. Who's that playing the drums? That's your Uncle Dave and all this. And I have uh, uh, he likes listening. I listened to it the other day and I'm like, actually, you know what? It's no bad. And I think that is it aged well. Aye, aye. I mean, there's bits in it. You'll always hear bits in your own recordings where you're like that. Oh, aye, that's a bit ropey. Or we shouldn't have done that. How did you How did you um, write songs? Did somebody write a song, bring it in? Or, did, or was it a a proper group effort. Uh, DJ was definitely like the sort of main songwriter. Mm-hmm. But we all had like between what me and him, like we all had we all had riffs, we all had ideas of songs. Everybody had things to contribute. Aye, Brian had because Brian's quite a good singer as well, so he had uh, he had loads of ideas as well. So a lot of the time, we I definitely felt like because I can't sing. I don't really hear lyrics. I don't really hear. I struggle to like come up with a melody and go, "I that would work." This is how the melody should sound. I just yeah. like here's a bunch of riffs that go together. Can we make this into a song? Yeah. Uh, and then, then normally DJ would have an idea. He's like, "Well, I've got this verse or a chorus or whatever. How do we fit it yeah. all together?" And you're like, "Oh, this will fit with that." And aye, aye. It was always do like. You, I was gonna say, do you write your own stuff even now? Or do you um, just mess? I, I mean, I've not... I was in, I would say, a re- rehearsal space band for a couple of years after I had my first kid. And mm-hmm. then that sort of ended. We really struggled to find a singer, so we kind of just sort of fizzled out before we did anything. Uh, and then it wasn't really until lockdown that I kind of picked yep. that up again. Uh, but then during lockdown, I had another kid, so <laughs> the guitar life gets put away, and it's I kind of life just takes over. But recently, it's like our youngest is now three, so he's a little mm-hmm. less dependent. So I'm like, actually, like I've got time in the evenings now where I really yeah, this is sca- get the I remember, I remember you recording. We done two weekends in the place you worked, uh, record the demo. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I think I would have been about 26, 27. Ah, like probably, that. aye, because I started at that place when I was 25. Yeah, and uh, Matt, because I, the position you're in just now is the position I was in back then, so I had a wee girl. Aye. Back, she is about to turn 18 now, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and she's uh, just that's uh, even that, so this, because I do gigs in the pubs still, yep. It'll be the strangest thing ever that that wee girl come Thursday will be able to be in the pub while I'm playing. Aye, it's the that's weirdest ever. That's mental. Because it's sometimes, it, it, sometimes it, it doesn't feel that long ago. No, well, sometimes I mean, that was, it like, only feels a few, maybe four or five years ago. Aye, because the other day when my boy Lachlan had asked to listen to her CD, I was like that. I remember recording some of that in like 2006. Yeah. And you're like, that's like a lifetime ago. Yeah. It's bonkers, but 
the stuff me and Chris done when we were teenagers, it's like a lifetime ago. It's almost like it's an, another person. Ah, uh, yeah. Although I remember doing it all, but I think it's that thing when you get into your sort of mid twenties. All of a sudden, I'm in my forties, but it doesn't feel that long ago. I still feel like the same person. I uh, like I've no like I was in that job up until less than a year ago. Like I left that place in April last year, and I've been mm-hmm. there eighteen years. Yeah. So you like it? Doesn't it feel like it was that long ago? Like I was recording <laughs> yourself, and I know. Do you still see the guys from Sooth? Aye, 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 all the time. Well, I, I, I say all the time, no, not all the time, but like... No, what, but you keep in touch with... Aye, we've got a WhatsApp group that we're talking daily, and it's like a stupid amount of chat that happens in that. It's like it's a long, 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 long messages all day long. Do you ever, uh, do you ever fancy putting the band back together, even just purely for fun for a couple of one-off gigs or something? Or is everybody not, not, just too... Not so much one-off gigs. We did... We did go... We did go in a rehearsal studio for a... A couple of times. But again, sort of just pre-Covid. And mm-hmm. then since then, it kind of... Messed that all up. But I, like, I've... Just with the kids and that, like, I've... Hardly played guitar. I couldn't play any of the... I, well, I could maybe play a couple of the songs, but... Yeah. I like listening to the stuff the other day in the car and like that. I, I can just about remember how that goes together. And that's yeah. about it. Like, I couldn't have you said, even the, the earlier stuff, no, nah, couldn't, couldn't remember. I mean, the, song, the songs you recorded for me, I've probably never played them in like 15 years. Aye, aye, exactly. Aye. But, uh, oh, I mean, it'd be, lo- be lovely to be in a band again. I think I've I had the time. One thing, like, we've always talked about that we'd never enjoy doing is try to get folk to come to your gigs. I like, always remember mm-hmm. that just being like when you're not when you're not being played in the radio, you don't have like a solid fan base. That whole dread of having to pay a promoter. I'm like, I, you need to you need to sell fifty tickets just to break even or whatever and you're like that. Folk are like, aye aye, I'll maybe come, aye, I'll maybe come. I give four tickets on the night and you're like that oh, all right. <laughs> Uh, it was always uh, the worst thing. Like we got to this point where, like, what's the point in playing in Glasgow? Like, I think no point in still the same. I think it probably imagine, imagine, is it? I uh, one of my good pals, his sons in a band, that are doing pretty well for themselves at the moment. But I just imagine, I, I the other week I was in, uh, was it broadcast for a thing for work, just picking up some kit, and his band were playing that night. And like going into like an empty venue and like seeing the band sitting in the bar and just remember that dread of oh will anybody turn up tonight? <laughs> I've yeah. sold enough tickets. I thought you were gonna say the dread of of the of the drums getting sound checked. Ah, I don't mind that. Don't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, long, as long as I'm standing behind the desk, I don't mind that. It's the standing on stage waiting for them to. You know what? It was it, it was good fun doing it. I don't know if I could. Part of me really really wants to start another band I, I love I, I, although I play the pubs and they uh, all fine it's, it's solo but there's, there is something if you can get another two or three four guys and you are all on the same page and yep. you get on there's nothing better than playing in a band especially when when you are all capable that the minute the, the three or four of you start playing it, the sound that comes out is what it's meant to be aye aye it's funny like I guess that's, I suppose, one of the things that why we stuck together and never really changed was we all got on so really well and like still doing all that. And yeah. I just, I always I remember, remember like, we had a, I don't know if you remember Lo-Fi Studios that was just off of George Square. It was like behind. Yeah, I played in the, uh, I jammed in there once. Aye, so we. Down, down, down the alleyway. Aye, aye. We used yeah. to have a. A room in there, like we used to rehearse every, I think it was a Wednesday, every Wednesday night and every Sunday afternoon. So we had like a, yeah. a locker with all our kit in it, uh, and then a specific room that we went to every, like had a book slot. And I mind, I think it was DJ wasn't there one day, and just talking about like folk being able to play together, like me, and my wee brother, and the bass player Brian. Uh, I remember we just 
Right, like, what kind of style of music you want to jam? And we're like, oh, let's do some death metal. Came up with some really bad death metal. Or oh, how about some, I don't know, some like No Doubt, a wee bit of ska sort of rock here. Yeah. How about, oh, why don't we jam some, come up with some daft riffs in this style? And it was just one of those ones you're like, actually, we're all suited very well together. Uh, uh, and, uh, last couple of questions. So there was a time that you came, you played in Stirling. And because that's yeah. quite close, close to where, I think it's only 25 minutes down the road for me. Me and my friend came along and my friend was amazed because at the end of the gig, I was like, oh, I'll, I, I kind of knew you by then. So I said, oh, come on, I'll, I'll kind of like, you can introduce you sort of thing. Yeah. So I blew everything away. And my pal was just, he was laughing because you were so, because you obviously worked in a in a recording studio. Aye. You were getting the, the guitar leads and following, the, following the, the curve of the lead and folding them all nice and correctly and that. And uh, our other pal that we used to go to all the time, he would always like tie his in a knot before chucking it at his back. <laughs> uh, He's like, like, what's this guy all about? He's taking forever to wrap his leads up because my pal would, would normally help him. I was like, nah, that's how you're meant to do it. See other placing leads every every two months that's because the leads are breaking because you're not meant to tie knots in them aye aye exactly uh, aye I mean that's I don't know I've been doing this now for what well 18 years of my last job so yeah aye nearly 20, and, uh, nearly 20 years last question for you right so you've got the old uh, Mount Rushmore question so who in your opinion who is the, the top for bands, musicians, that in your opinion, they are just untouchable. They are just at the top of the pile, whether it be songwriting, performance, everything, they're, they're, like, they're just the full package. Who, who would be your four? What, nowadays or ever? Right, well, go for it. Uh, now, let, let's go from the past that got us into music, obviously it was like Metallica, Pantera, and then maybe the first few albums, Machine Head, in fact, even like the later albums now, I suppose. Uh, and ABBA. And ABBA, of course, I. But nowadays, like, I think I'd sort of left, kind of, didn't leave heavy music sort of in the back, but I hadn't found anything new for Donkeys, and then one of my mates, like, I'd always known Bleed From Within were about, but wasn't he into yep. them because they grew up, I think most of them are Philarp Call, which is, isn't that far for you look. And, yep. uh, and we played, I think we played with one of Ali Richardson's bands years ago at like G2, I think it was called Paradox or something. Uh, so him and my wee brother were quite pally because we were both like sort of at the same standard at that time in terms of drumming. So I'd always knew about them and it wasn't until they brought out, uh, it wasn't a, the end of all things, we you know it was the album previous to that. I was like, okay. wait a minute, they've totally changed. So yeah. I'd say they're definitely one of my top bands, even the now. And like have I, you mellowed a little bit? Is there any, nah, any nah. sneaky one? <laughs> nah, I'll, I'll get right into that Russian band, or, well, they're not quite all Russian, but that Slaughter to Prevail. Right. Aye, right, loving you, that at the moment. You, and then big big Sleep Token fan now and all. I think they're discovered. You're just going to be a complete metalhead forever. Aye. <sighs> Why no? <laughs> but saying yeah. that, like, I love... I don't know if you know that guitarist, Corey Wong, that played in Wolfpack, and he's got his own solo stuff called Corey Wong and the Wong Notes. Right. He's... Uh, it's all kind of, like, jazz kind of big band stuff, but or kind of funk jazz and, and like, a big band setting, and it's it's incredible. One of... Just like, watching him play, like, his right hand, his rhythm hand's unreal. Mm -hmm. So, I... <laughs> Just before you go there as well, you'd said something that's quite interesting. So, on the previous episodes, talking to people that play in the in the, the pubs, similar to myself doing covers, right? We were, we were talking about how, see, new stuff that comes out has got a shelf life. So, a, a new song comes out by a new artist, and it's really popular for maybe six months, maybe a year. Yeah, aye. And, and it... It's, it's tired, you've got to kind of shelve it and, and you've got to get something else. But the stuff that's 40, 50 years old, 
still goes down great. Aye. Right. And the question was always like, why is that the case, right? But when we were talking about it and we we're seeing you obviously in the sixties, in my opinion, was when music had properly changed, like people were trying things that had never been done before. Seventies progressed on to that. The eighties had its own sound. Even the nineties, I mean obviously you're talking about rock music. There was so much happening in the eighties and the nineties. Personally though, I feel though, see when it got to two thousand, everything had been done. So see everything uh-huh. that's came out uh, there's some stuff that come out that's brilliant, but it, it's a rehash of previous things. Like you can listen to something and go, "That's really good," but it sounds like blah 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 blah. I mean, that's it. Like, obviously, popularity of being in a band grew. Or my take on it is like, back in the fifties and sixties, you couldn't go into doing the street, walk in a guitar shop, pick up a guitar, and just go, "Hi, there's a bunch of guys in the corner that are into bands." And I've got music mm-hmm. and can play guitars and drums and here's a bassist. You couldn't go to, I don't think you could go to university and study a mod- modern music course and pop yeah, music. Exactly. So like it all just becomes saturated and then even like the, I suppose the way you consume music as well, like it's all instantaneous so you're like, I'm no surprise mm-hmm. songs don't stick about because you're like, there's new music released all the time and you can hear it the day it's released, you don't need to go to a shop. You don't need to buy it on something and then go home and you've got like nearly an entire day's worth of travelling before you can get home and actually listen to it. You just go, all right, here's the music on my phone. You listen to it and you go, right, I've heard it. And you're like, it's not sitting in your hand. It's not in your house and you don't look at it. The thing we discussed was nowadays it's limitless. You can listen to whatever. Whereas back when we were teenagers, right, you would save up your money, you would go and buy an album that you were wanting. You didn't have anything else to listen to, so you pretty much studied that album from the first song right. right to the last song. You studied the booklet, the artwork, everything that came along with it, the song, song structure, you know, why is this one at number one? And then uh, yeah. number four, this one, number seven. And whereas that's all completely lost now because it's just streaming. Uh, and I mean, I must and- admit, like, I still... Like I love the ac- love being able to access music a lot better nowadays. Bad things, but I definitely have to get out of the habit of listening to a full album. Yeah, like I, I get asked a question during some gigs last summer that was working on, and just like standard chat after doing a sound check or whatever, or once you've set up and folk asking like, "Oh, what playlists do you listen to?" I'm like, the "Fuck, do you mean?" <laughs> I don't, don't listen to playlists, I listen to bands and I listen to their albums and I listen to it as a yep. whole, like I don't go alright I've listened to the first three songs, I like the first one I'll go back to the first one, I'm like no there's maybe like another seven songs that I've not heard yet ah, You've got to listen to that to finish and then figure out what one's your favourite your... I mean if a band have gone to the time to spend creating an album putting it in an order that's cohesive in some sort of well yeah. You would expect them to write an album that, and then put the songs together and go, aye, that makes sense in that order. And especially if it's like a concept album where you're like, it's a full story yeah. the whole length of the album. You're like, you have to listen to it as an album. Aye, it's completely lost nowadays, though. It's a, it's a uh, shame. But, aye. But, uh, but, but okay, that, that's us. That's, that was good. Thank you for uh, coming good. on for a chat. Good seeing you again as well. You're all in. And uh, I'll make sure... Uh, I'm going to contact DJ and that and uh, see if we can get Sooth back on the go, <laughs> just so that I can along and cheer you on. And aye. now I've got like, a mini me that can come along as well. Aye, aye, absolutely. She's got more, she's got more hair than me, thankfully. Aye. <laughs> but no, that was, th- that was good. Thank you aye. for coming along. Thanks for uh, having us. We'll see how it goes. Aye, nice one, Ian. Fun. Cheers. Thanks. Aye.